Wow, that video is amazing. And um, just being in the room, knowing that I'm standing in the same room that Frederick Douglass, <laughs> a personal hero, has actually been in this room, I am just overwhelmed. So I'm going to do my best to try to get through this. I don't think I'm going to be able to do it, so I apologize in advance. Um, first of all, I want to say congratulations to UMass Lowell on the 25th anniversary of their labor education program, and really congratulations, Susan. <laughs> so my memories of Charlie, I guess I, I get the easy path. <laughs> I, I get to say and talk about a man that I loved very much. And so uh, I first met Charlie about 1995, and I was a steward for IBW Local 1505 at the time. And um, it was a long time ago. And Charlie was a new director of this labor extension program and came in to do his steward's training. And um, I can really remember what sticks in my mind was the icebreaker that Charlie did. And what he had us do was he had us pick a partner, and we had to stand up and fall backwards into that person's arms. Has anybody ever heard of that training program? It was impossible to do. It, it was just, okay, I'm gonna do it, can't do it. So that was my first memory of Charlie, is that he always tested those boundaries, right? He used that exercise and every other thing that he did to explore trust building, really, and resistance that we have and we hold on to to building those relationships of trust. For Charlie, those interactions weren't just an occasion to teach. They weren't. They also were opportunities for all of us to learn. And Charlie just didn't show up just for trainings. Charlie would show up for Christmas parties at our union hall. Charlie would show up for uh, union meetings as a guest speaker. He would come to the UMass Labor Day walks, any rally, any protest, any anything. Charlie was there, right? Charlie would show up. Anything to promote solidarity and to have a discussion about the labor movement as a continuous and endless cycle of identity. It wasn't just a job for him. Like, it isn't a job for almost everybody in this room, as our spouses can most surely uh, attest to, right? <laughs> In Charlie, it was the lifeblood of who he was. Once he gets sick, I honestly believe that his passion for teaching and his desire to continue to share the knowledge that he had kept him with us far longer than any one of us could have predicted. So things that Charlie taught. Charlie taught solidarity at all times, in all things. Once I remember a story about Charlie when he worked at the Fort River Shipyard. And I don't remember the man's name, but there was an older man that was going to be disciplined at the Fort River Shipyard. Let's say his name was Ed. So Charlie heard that Ed was going to get walked out of the, the plant, and he got really pissed off. So he talked to all his co-workers and said, if they walk Ed out, we're all going with him. And so guess what? They walked Ed out. So Charlie and everybody that he had talked to packed up their toolboxes, and out they went too. And they went in the parking lot, and then they looked at each other and said, what the hell did we just do? <laughs> so the first lesson, you need a plan. <laughs> Charlie talked that isolationism at work leads to erosion of solidarity, and that that is not unintentional on management's part. Charlie believed in continuous bargaining to deal with continuous change in the workplace. I can remember calling Charlie when I worked for 1505 with Raytheon, about a Six Sigma initiative that Raytheon was rolling out. <coughs> I knew he was really concerned about the meetings and that the committees that they were forming were essentially direct dealing, but we also, as a union, didn't know how to deal with that because we didn't want to buy into the premise of working with management and then owning that program. So um, Charlie was really troubled by our union and any <coughs> in action for whatever reason. He strongly believed that the union's failure or refusal to engage and not take advantage of the opportunities to promote solidarity was a trick and trap of management. 
Challenge was quick to point out that without us being involved, the union risked being rendered as insignificant and we risked losing our voice. If you're not at the table, you're most likely on the menu, right? <laughs> Instead of attending these meetings on management's terms, though, Charlie advises to attend, but insist on our own terms. That's how Charlie lived his life, on his own terms. In other words, have a plan. Management has a plan, so we better have one, too. Charlie taught that everything should be viewed as bargaining. Every meeting with management should contain the same strategies. The union should be involved, the union's perspectives and values should be present, and, un and unity and solidarity should be built through involvement in every single meeting. So here we are, 25 years later, and we see that his work lives on through his programs and his teachings. You can actually access them at charlierichardson.org. His legacy also lives on through his wife, Nancy, his children and grandchildren that we just saw in the video. So, closing remembrances. When I think of Charlie, this story comes to mind. Bobby Kennedy once said, each time a person stands up for an idea, or acts to improve the lot of others, or strikes out against injustice, he sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers of energy in Danton, those ripples build a current that can sweep down the muddiest walls of oppression and resistance. Charlie loved kayak in wild white water. They showed a picture here tonight and I remember seeing it. Him in the midst of that wild water, battling the wall of waves, fiercely furiously, with great joy and happiness and joy. That's the spirit. That's the essence of Charlie. On my bulletin board at work, I keep, I keep two great mentors. <coughs> These men are Father Ed Boyle, beloved priest of the Labor Guild, and Charlie Richardson. They remind me of why I do what I do. Charlie Richardson, presente. <laughs>